Do any of you remember having a, a racetrack, something like that, when you were kids? Anybody? Yeah, and my brother and I, we had big battles over who was going to get one particular car. We both, we both liked it, and it was just a tiny bit faster. And so, yeah, we would, we would race that thing and run it all over the place, and uh, we kind of abused it if the truth, if the truth were told. And, and so oftentimes, we would get the car going too fast, and what would it do if you got it going too fast, go around the turn? fly off the track and then of course we'd have to stop and you'd pick the car back up and put it back on track so it could do what it was supposed to do. I think that's kind of an image of what our Heavenly Father wants to do with us. Uh, I don't know about you but I get off track sometimes, amen? And so we need the church and we need one another to help us get focused, to get a, help us to, to kind of get back on track of where, of where we need to go. Now, now, the cars that my brother and I raced, sometimes when they flew off the track, they'd run into something and they had kind of dents and scrapes on the paint after a little bit. Did yours have the same thing? Yeah. Our lives are kind of that way too. We carry dents, we carry scrapes, we have some injuries, we have some deals that, that as we come back on track where God wants us, he helps us in healing those things. Our vision is to make, mature, mobilize, and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ in the community and beyond. That involves helping us get on track and stay on track and function the way that God has created us to function as individuals and as a congregation of faith. And this month, we've been looking at some, uh, some changes in our attitudes, some shifts that were necessary for you and me to, to stay true to the track, because in the same way as individuals can sometimes get off track, sometimes congregations and churches <laughs> can kind of get off the track where God wants them to be. And so, so this month has been about, okay, let's make sure we're running the track that God wants us to be, and we need to, uh, to do that. And so we looked at what it meant to, to move from reaching to making, that it was not just about, um, uh, and then from informing to equipping, that it wasn't just about helping people get saved, but after we were saved, we are, we are sent. And so it's not just about coming into a relationship with Jesus, it's about after we come to that relationship with Jesus that we take steps and that we continue growing. The sad thing is in many churches, there are people who are Christians, but they're, they're baby Christians, and they've been baby Christians for 40 years. They've never taken steps of maturity, the next steps of growth. They've never been involved in, and worked on the habits necessary to mature. And so, so we're about helping to create those environments where people can face the truth about themselves, the truth about God, and see how they can apply God's truth to their situations. And we talked about shifting. Uh, Shrum talked about from, from program to purpose. And then last week we looked at activity to relationship. And so today we're looking at what it means to move from accumulating to deploying. There's been a great big debate over the last 20 years about what the church has to be all about. And, uh, and there was a, <clears throat> a, a time, there was this whole thing about being attractional that you had to be attract people and you had to, to bring in a whole group when in fact, I think that we need to shift our mindset from just trying to have people show up on Sunday to seeing this and the other environments that we create as a place where we will prepare people to send them out. Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so we learned, and, and you know, we keep saying this over and over again, but a disciple is one who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and serving with Jesus. <laughs> I was, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I felt a little prideful yesterday. Uh, we had uh, the, the Jamonville <clears throat> uh, retreat was up there, and a guy named Jeff Vanderhoof was there, and he was an illusionist, and uh, he did a bunch of magic tricks and things like that, and then he tied that into the messages that he was sharing with the group. It was re really, really pretty cool, but what, what I loved was uh, he's coming down, he's talking about how important it was to keep, you know, to keep focus of where we need to be and not let our vision get distracted, and he talked about how 
magicians are sworn to never tell the secret, but he said, he said the whole secret is to where you direct their, our attention so that we don't really see what's going on as they do that, you know, the sleight of hand. And so he said, as a church, we need to be focused on our vision and mission. And he said, he said something like, he said, I bet you don't know what the vision and mission of your church is. And they said, oh, yes, we do. <laughs> and, it was, and it was really cool because we are beginning to, uh, that I believe is beginning to get, uh, to be impregnated into our DNA. So that's exactly what we are about. Now, oftentimes, churches are evaluated in a variety of ways. We count the number of people who attend. We count the amount of the offerings. And sometimes we look at, at, at what the types of buildings that we are. Bill Hull has called that the holy trinity of bodies, bucks, and buildings. In other words, and sometimes people evaluate their churches in that way. Now, that method of evaluation, that, that is not wrong. Actually, it's healthy. It's part of the indicator is, okay, what are we doing? Is it, uh, it, are, are we accomplishing what we want to accomplish? But that sort of evaluation, I believe, does not go far enough. It's too limiting. Sometimes it does not reflect if disciples are actually being made. Sometimes it doesn't reflect if disciples are actually being matured and mobilized and multiplied. Now, uh, you need to understand that after, uh, uh, that every time our staff gets together, after every event, after every single worship service, every single message, we evaluate what happened. And we have a series of questions that we ask ourselves after we do anything. And so we look at that so that we can be constantly trying to improve because Jesus deserves our very best. Amen. And so we're trying to evaluate that, evaluate what is what we are doing, is what we are attempting to do. Is it accomplishing what we believe God has called us to accomplish? I think that perhaps a better way of evaluating, a better way of, of looking at church health, and, and we so often look at a church's seating capacity, but perhaps a better way is to look at a church's sending capacity in other words who are we sending are we willing to send our very best it's interesting some of you know that um, uh, Adam it's now been what over a year that a a Adam Swigert you know he was one of our uh, uh, lay leaders and he did some wonderful things in preaching and leading and and I had more than one person come up to me and say oh what are we going to do when Adam leaves I said listen that's what we're about we're about training leaders up. We're about lifting people up and then releasing them to do what God wants them to do. And, and while we miss Adam as a person, it's amazing. There are other people who have stepped up and are now serving in many of the areas where Adam was serving. You see, as we mobilize and multiply disciples, we believe that Jesus wants us to be every single day on mission for him. And you see, disciples, we serve as, as missionaries where we work, learn, and play. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are missionaries right here in our communities. And as we think about, uh, as we change from accumulating and just trying to, to hold and bring everybody in and attracting and gathering, we are about developing, sending, and releasing every single one of us to serve. God has equipped each and every one of us in this room in a different way. And so while much of our service is here within our walls as we serve our congregation, we would be lax if the only thing that we were training and equipping you to do was to serve within the walls of this church. We must be about sending people out to demonstrate God's love and to share our faith with those people who are in our circle of influence. Sharing our faith with the people who, who are lost everywhere that, where we work or where we go to school. You see, as a disciple, you have been strategically planted in places where there are people that only you can reach. 
Have you noticed that not everybody in our community is coming to worship services in our churches in our town? So how are they going to learn about the gospel? It's through each and every one of us as we go out. We are sending. Now what that means is we have to understand that Pastor Tom and I, we, we are pastors of our church, but everyone is a minister of the gospel. Every single one of you are a minister of the gospel, and God has called you to serve him everywhere. And so to do that, we have to be a people who are developing as disciples personally. I want you to think, about, think for a moment, what is God doing in your heart, in your life? Where is the cutting edge of your faith? Where are the great challenges right now as you are growing? You see, one of the things that is dangerous for us, but we human beings, especially we in the United States, we pursue comfort at all costs, amen? We want everything to be easy, we want it to be, but in truth, we grow the most when it's tough. Have you noticed that? And so I want you to look at your life and say, okay, what is, where, perhaps it's an attitude that God is calling on me to change. You see, as disciples, we must be developing personally, we must be making disciples in our own homes, and we have to learn to love a lost and hurting world and see our calling as those who have a part to play in winning people to Jesus. Sometimes I think we forget that. Sometimes I think that we, we, uh, we can easily get an attitude that, well, you know, that's what we're, uh, Pastor Chris, that's what we're paying you to do. Well, I, I appreciate that every two weeks. <laughs> I do appreciate that. But you realize I have a limited circle of influence. There's only so many people that I see and that I know. And so if the, world, if the gospel of Jesus Christ were limited to who was impacted by the pastors of this church, we would be severely limited. God is sending each and every one of us. Our mission tells us that we endeavor to fulfill our mission by developing biblical disciples through intentional relationships. And last week we talked about how everything is, is about relationships. Relationships with ourselves, with our family, with our friends, with our co-workers, with our classmates, with our community, with, you know, with believers, with non-believers in business and school and sports. You get the picture. Those are the places, those are the people to whom you have been sent every day. They are your mission field. They are the ones that God desires to minister to through you. Now, closely related to the word discipline, or to the word disciple, is the word discipline. And to many of us, that's a dirty word. <laughs> we, we, we don't like discipline. It's, it can be hard. It's difficult. And to live with discipline, to have that in our lives, requires from us intention. We have to be intentional about how we are living. It means deciding to live with the habits, with the priorities, with the values that we believe are necessary to be a biblical disciple. Living with intention and building into our lives those habits of, of Bible study and prayer and contemplation and serving and worshiping together with the community of faith. Living with intention means then we will not be blown about by the winds of life, that we are not living by accident or living by chance. It means that we will live differently than the rest of the people on our street. Look what Romans 12, 2 says. Do not conform to the what? Values and opinions of this world. Let me say that again. Do not conform to the values and opinions of this world. Instead, let God transform you by teaching you the right and true way to think. I think this verse is a call to you and me to allow God to help us take control of our thoughts and take control of our lives. And for many of us, that means that we need to move away from our thinking that being a disciple is all about Sunday morning. 
It's not. That's what some of the world thinks being a Christian is, that you give up your Sunday morning another, uh, to, to come and sit in this building. It is so much more than that. You see, God is sending us to a hurting world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And here's how it works. I think every single one of us either knows or is in contact with someone who probably wants to change their life. And you and I have to understand and realize that they won't change until they get really, 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 what? Really, really fed up with where they are. They won't change until they get sick and tired of being sick and tired. They, they, they may say things like, oh, I'm just so stressed out and I've got this problem and that problem or I'm just too depressed or, or I'm overworked and I'm too busy. You know, I, uh, so-and-so doesn't like me and I look in the mirror and I don't even like myself. Why would anybody like me? I don't even like, I don't feel like life, I don't like the life that I'm living right now and the mantra can go on and on and on and nothing, nothing will happen in their life Nothing will happen in our lives if we feel that way until we first just get so dissatisfied with the way it is. And we think, oh, well, it is what it is. I hate that saying. They just say it is what it is. They throw up their hands and resign. They'll never change. They'll never change. Now, in truth, there are some things around us that you and I cannot change. Amen? But we can change ourselves. And we can change our response. We can change our attitudes. We can change the way we pursue that situation. You see, nothing will happen in our life. Nothing will happen in the lives of the people we come in contact with until they decide that's enough. You see, people don't change until the pain of change becomes less than the pain of staying where we are. Think about that. People do not change. The people that we have been sent to disciple, people don't change. They don't change. You and I don't change until the pain of change is less than the pain of staying where we are. Where people finally say, that's it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of being frustrated. I'm tired of being overworked. And they get to that point where they're just at the end of their rope and they begin to look around for answers. And there you are. A disciple of Jesus Christ who does not have all the answers, but who is in relationship with the one who does. Say amen. You have been strategically sent to people in those situations, in the places where you live, where you work, where you go to school, and where you play. You, in those places, are the embodiment of the Savior of Jesus Christ. You are the sent ones of God to those particular situations at those particular times, serving them because of the particular relationships that you have built with them. And then, if you and I are willing, God will use us in miraculous ways. Jeremiah says, you'll find me. God is speaking. He says, you'll find me when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. Living intentionally on mission means getting serious about finding God's will and following it. It means that we realize that we have been called by God. We have been empowered by God. We have been sent by God. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit with the, with the power, with the gifts, the abilities to do what God has called us to do. And then he has deployed us into his world. And we are his ambassadors every single day. And we have to see every day as a fresh opportunity to be involved in God's mission in the world. Your mission in the world is different than my mission in the world. God has a unique one that he has shaped and formed and sent you to fulfill. 2 Corinthians 3 says, 
as God's Spirit works within us, we are being transformed to become more like Christ. This change from one degree of glory to another comes from the Lord. You see, as we are disciples following Him, the process is, uh, is continuous. It's not something that we achieve and we just have it right there. It's not in an instant. It's ongoing. Uh, the message paraphrase says, our lives become gradually brighter and brighter. And that's what I want to have happen in your life, that the light of Christ, as you are deployed wherever God has sent you, that the light of Christ will continuously shine brighter and brighter through you every day of your life. Now, sometimes we look at, we look at that verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. This week, I was reading some context of that, and, and I found these verses a little early in that chapter. It says this, You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Do you realize that? You are a letter from Christ. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You are a letter of Christ sent to the world. Let that settle in a little bit. And he didn't send you postage due. <laughs> you are sent to the world. Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says this, Timothy, I now want you to take the things that I've taught you and pass them on to other faithful men who will be able to pass them on to others. Now notice there are, there are four different people, going, things going on here, four different levels, four different generations. Uh, Paul says, okay, Timothy, I coached you. Timothy, I poured into your life. And so, Timothy, now I want you to coach somebody else. I want you to go and give your life to somebody else so that then they will be able to coach somebody else. You see, as we have been sent, as we have been deployed, it is God's calling for us to reproduce spiritually. He's called upon us to pour our lives into other people. And so as, as God poured into the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul poured into Timothy, and he said, Paul says to Timothy, now I want you to pour your life into, into somebody else who will be able to pour their life into somebody else. Who are you pouring your life into? If you can't think of it immediately, you may have to go to prayer. God has called each and every one of us to take what he has placed within us and share that with, with other people. You see, there are people who have poured into my life. There are people who have mentored me. There are people who have coached me. There are people who have challenged me. There are people who have taught me. And, and what you receive on Sunday mornings and other times throughout the week as we minister together is in, in some part what they have poured into me Then I am trying to pour into you and be a channel. And then God has called for you to take what you have received from me and Pastor Tom and others, take that and pour it into other People. That's what it means to be deployed as a missionary of Jesus Christ, serving others in the name of Jesus for his glory. Here's the goal. Ephesians says, Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or made a lie sound like the truth. You know, we probably ought to read that during every election cycle, amen, <laughs> because it's hard to discern. That's why we need God's word. God says that one of the marks of spiritual maturity is that other people won't be as easy, won't, won't as easily sway us away from the truth. I don't want you to be a baby believer all your life. I don't want you to just settle for having your soul saved. God saved you to serve. There are many spiritually immature people who never go to the point 
of serving others. They never go to the point of taking what God has placed within them and sharing it with others so that they might grow. See, spiritually immature people often are always changing their minds about what they believe. They say, okay, I believe this, and then they hear something else that sounds good, and they say, okay, well, now I believe this, or they hear something else, and they do not have the ability to discern the truth from a lie. You and I can recognize the big things in life that are big lies, right? But what we miss sometimes are the little subtle things that can so easily creep into our lives, can so easily creep into, into our spirituality. And so we need to stay tuned in. And God has called you and me to be the truth tellers in many situations. But sometimes we shrink from that and we just say, I don't want to get involved with that. But recognize we have been sent. There's an old cliche. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Ephesians continues, verse 16. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love. You see that phrase? Hold to the truth. How? In love. What happens is many Christians go to one end of that spectrum or the other. Some are all truth, and they'll beat you over the head with it. Do you ever meet anybody like that? Don't look at them if they're here, okay? <laughs> and then some people are, are so, you know, say, oh, we're just all about love. We're all about love. We're all about love. And they miss the truth part. We need both. Speaking the truth in love, becoming more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. In other words, we're grabbing onto that and we help each other grow. And, and we, we, we say, okay, I'm going to be here for you and I need you to be here for me. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to support you. That's why I believe so much in small groups. There are many steps in your spiritual growth that you will not take on your own. Because we need the encouragement of other people to help us move into some of the areas where God has called us. And so you encourage me, I encourage you, we encourage one another, and then we are sent to a lost and hurting world. Hebrews 10.24 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We are deployed, we are sent to spur one another's on. Men, let me ask you a question. Do you have any men in your life that you've given permission to spur you on? Ladies, do you have other ladies that you have given permission to spur you on to be a better woman of God? If you can't think of them immediately, you need to find them. Uh, Anybody ride horses here? Not very many. (laughs) Maybe you've seen them in old spaghetti westerns, right? They they jump on the horse. And what does a cowboy have on the heels of his boots? Spurs. What are the spurs there for? They're They're there to help the horse go where it's supposed to go. And sometimes that's not pleasant. Amen? Sometimes for you and I to take the next step on our spiritual journey, we need some people to speak into our lives words that are hard to hear as they speak the truth to us. But you see, when we are in relationship with them, we know that those words are spoken not to hurt us, but to help us grow. Scripture says there's a verse not in your outline. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We need one another to spur one another on. Romans 1.12. I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. So we live on mission. There are some things we need to remember as we are deployed. First of all, God loves everybody just the way they are. Amen? But he loves us too much to let us stay that way. God wants us to move. He wants us to grow. And God's part is God does the changing. You and I can't change anybody. Have you noticed that, husbands, wives? We can't change each other, okay? Only God can do that changing. God who stands willing to change, willing to form us more perfectly into the image of Christ, he is the one who can take the clay of our lives and change us to be more and more like him. Human's part is cooperation. We have to cooperate with the working of the Holy Spirit. We have to decide 
we have to be intentional about allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. We have to be intentional about doing our part with the habits, the attitudes, and the behaviors. Now, you have to understand it's the same thing with the people that you are pouring your life into who aren't part of the church yet. You can't change them. Only God can. You're providing the relationship, giving them the, the opportunity, the encouragement to cooperate with the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Hebrews 12.1 says this, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially any sin that distracts us so that we can run the race that lies ahead of us. So first, no, God loves everybody, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. Second, Every one of us has spiritual growth that's needed. None of us in this room have arrived. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, I know that I am not yet what God wants me to be. I haven't reached that goal. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else, if he says, hey, I still have work to do, what's that say about you and me? We do also. But I keep moving toward it to make it mine because Christ made me and saved me for this. I know that I haven't yet reached my goal, but there's one thing I always do, forgetting the past and straining toward what is ahead. I keep my eyes focused on the goal so that I may one day win the prize that God has called me to receive through Christ in the life above. All of you who are spiritually mature should think this way too. So you see, we are sent, we are deployed, not as perfect people. And so as we pour our lives into the other people around us, it's not that we don't have work to do, we do. But we know a God who is able, a God who is able to help us move into the future that he have for us. And number three, you can live on mission. If you decide you want to, you can live on mission every day. Look what Ephesians 3 says. Now by his, that's God's, mighty power at work within us, God is able. As you look at what you think God is calling you to as you are deployed, you may say, I, I just can't do that. Don't try to do it in your own strength. God never intended for you to do by his mighty power at work within us, God is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. That's what God wants for you. And he wants us to understand his incredible promise in Philippians 4, 13. One of my life verses says, Jesus... Uh, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I love that in the, in the amplified version. And I want to leave you with this verse from Romans 12. And this is my challenge to each of us today as we consider this shift from accumulating to deploying to being sent out. Romans says, because God is merciful to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what do we do? We offer ourselves to you every day, to God every day, in every way, in every place, in every situation. We are sent ambassadors of His. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have poured into each and every one of us. And God, may you help us as only you can to be deployed and sent missionaries of yours in all the places where we live and work and play and go to school. 
May God, we understand that, uh, that you have given to us the ability, the strength, and the calling to reach to people who are lost and hurting. Help us, God, to understand that call and to faithfully step into it. In your holy name we pray.